Jean Paul Sartre. Where's Vicky? Vicky is our French teacher. She snowed in. Great. So I can say Sartre. The actual name. If people who want to know how you say this, it's Jean Jean Paul Sartre. But it is that French R in the back of your throat. I can't really do it, and I certainly can't do it all night. So since Vicky's not here to give me the evil eye, I can just say Jean Paul Sartre. Um, Born in 1905. Is that what it says in your flyer? 1905. Good. Good. I got that wrong last time. So born in 1905 uh, to a solidly middle class family. This is the the, the key thing. Or or, or bourgeois family, which is probably more accurate. We we don't really we never we've never really had a bourgeoisie in the United States. We have a middle class. We've never had a bourgeoisie in the sense of which Europe has had one which is probably a subject for a whole other lecture. So he's born into a bourgeois family, which means they have means, they have some culture, and they truly value education as in and for itself. One of the highest things you could achieve was to be highly educated. Not because you got money for that, although there was nothing wrong with it, but because receiving the education itself was deemed to be good. As in an earlier generation, having a son who went into the church or a daughter who was in a nunnery was in and of itself a good thing. You would brag to your friends, oh, well, my daughter, she's in the convent of our sister of Guadalupe, right? And that would be sort of a status symbol. Uh, For the bourgeoisie in continental Europe, for about 100 years, give or take, it really was a significant achievement to have the kinds of educational status that uh, Sartre would go on to achieve amongst others. So this is key to keep in mind. Also key is when he's born. Notice when he's born, 1905. As with Wittgenstein, he's a little older than Wittgenstein. Um, but there, he's going to live through World War I and World War II, the two sort of mountain ranges of the 20th century. Everything is you can figure from those two events about what's happening, particularly in continental Europe. And for, the 19, for, for World War I, he's still a young man. But people are going away and disappearing. There's all this civil unrest. There's a lot of tension. Um, so he goes, he's a bright young man, likes to write, likes to read. Family has shows great promise in him. Um, he goes off to, the, the at this point, extraordinarily rigorous and, and high-quality French schools. Also strange. Um, these schools were sort of vaguely medieval still. Um, and, for instance, when he was in the equivalent of high school, you stayed in dorms with uh, children of many classes, not quite the, the upper nobility and certainly not sort of the peasant rabble. But anything just below that and anything just above that would be thrust into these dorms for years at a time. And it was sort of the students versus the instructors. And so it had this, this, this great mixing uh, of, of, of milieu. And it was an opportunity to bond very closely with people that you would probably not meet otherwise. And even today in in France, it's said, I mean, I have no reason to doubt this, it seems to be true, um, that the two groups of people that are your close acquaintances are your family and your friends from school. Because you're born into your family and you survive school with those friends. (laughs) Right? They really, in France, it's really a matter of surviving school. It's, it's unbelievably rigorous, uh, particularly in, in Sartre's time. Much nicer today in some ways. Um, and so, of course, he's doing well because he's Sartre. He's, he's popular. He's the funny kid. He writes plays. He has people involved in all these dialogues and um, pulling stunts and whatnot. And he goes on to study and read in, in philosophy. Um, and, and shockingly, really, one of the first blows in his life is... He fails. He goes to take his oral examinations for philosophy, and he does not pass, which stuns everybody. Because everybody's like, well, he's, this, you know, he's, he's one of the smartest guys in the class. And if you looked at his class, I mean, it was a class of remarkably brilliant people. And so he has to stay an extra year to study again. And in that year, he meets Simone de Beauvoir, another revolutionary event in his life. One failing. And what he realized immediately when he failed, and all his friends told him this, he says, look, you gave an original answer in a traditional form. What you want to do is give a traditional answer in a original form. They don't want new stuff. They just want catchy 
uh, uh, sort of advertising, catchy marketing of the traditional ideas. And so to prepare for this, he starts working with Simone de Beauvoir. And from the moment they meet, apparently, pretty much immediately they're like, ooh, this is going to work for us. We, we like each other a lot. And so they start working and reading and writing together virtually daily. And so the second year through, um, he, he passes. And she's also taking her exams at the same time. And so when the instructors gathered, the question was, who's first and who's second? And Simone is four years younger than Sartre at this point and, and has had many years less preparation. Uh, and they finally gave it to Sartre, sort of, a, a tie goes to the runner or whatever. They said, all right, he's one and, and de Beauvoir is two, which is no mean feat by either of them because they both uh, became brilliant philosophers in their own right. And what they do at this point, and, and this is important, as you'll see, for his philosophy, but also for his personal life, is they come to this arrangement. And Sartre has worked out that he does not want to be married. He thinks his married, mar being married is sort of a, a, an intellectual death and sort of caving into the bourgeoisie. He's, um, he's anti-bourgeoisie. It turns out he's not that anti-bourgeoisie. But he, he feels himself at this point to be anti-bourgeois. And, and the worst thing you can do is to, to go into the bourgeois milieu is to get married. So he says, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be the most important relationship in each other's lives. But we're going to live separately. And we're going to have other relationships. But we're going to be totally honest about this and keep each other completely informed. And against all odds, they pull this off for their entire lives. Um, and, and, and it really is a remarkable feat. But what's key here is this is the beginning, believe it or not, of, of, or beginning or part of the beginning of, of Sartre's ideal of existentialism. Because one of the key components of existentialism is you are free. You make your life the way you want it. And for them to sit down and work out in, in great detail, they actually have sort of essentially a contract that they worked out. Um, directly, with all of the emotional pain and, and tension and, and everything that that's going to cause, but to sit down and say, look, we make our own lives. We don't have to live the way our parents have lived. We don't have to live the way society has said we've had to live. We can do things, not rebel against them so much, although there was an element of that, but just say, what do we actually want? De Beauvoir does not want to get married because if you're a French woman in 19, that would be 35, I think, or 4, being married is, is, is a, a very specific kind of undertaking. I mean, you have rules. You're going to live a certain way. You can forget about going out and being a professor and pursuing your education and being a writer. No, it, it's, it's not going to happen. You're going to keep the house, and he's going to go out and work. And she's a, she wants absolutely zero part of that. Um, and so they work this out as a test case for can we make our own? Can we make the world new for us? And so they, they work this out. They're living in Paris. Life is good. And then they get their jobs opposite sides of France. And, and I'm not sure exactly how this works. The French education system is very complicated, but they more or less just told you where you were going to go. And Sartre gets sent to Le Havre, I think is how you say that, um, where he teaches in a high school, which is hilarious, right, to, to think of him in, in this sort of... And it's a very, it's sort of a classically bourgeoisie high school. It would be, I can't even think of an equivalent. It'd be sort of going to um, uh, Redmond, being assigned to a high school in Redmond, right? You're, you're now this sort of upper middle class school where the, te the this parents have pretensions and they have these big plans for their students. And enroll Sartre. And he's like, yeah, I'm not part of this program. And, and he becomes sort of an anti-establishment professor. The professor of the first lecture, of the, at the graduation every year, the newest professor always gives the sort of convocation. And traditionally, you speak on themes of education and whatnot. And Sartre walks up and says, movies, you should all go watch a lot of films. Because <laughs> films are great. I love film. It's the new medium. It's the art form for the 20th century. This is where our ideas are going to come from. This is the greatest art form that's been invented in 200 years. And he just goes on and on. At a time when going to the cinema, basically, the devil lived in the cinema. Right? He was going to corrupt your morals. And of course, the students are like, oh, yeah, we love this guy. Right? And, 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 but, but the parents, they were a little dicey. 
Plus, he's living in the very poorest section of the city, down on the wharfs in his hotel room. Um, and he liked it, and he said he just left his windows open, and he could hear and see the whole world from there. He could the, the workers from the docks would come through. All the immigrant sailors would come through. The prostitutes would come through. The business people would come through. The merchants, the traders. And he could see them and hear them every single day of his life. And he loved that. And it's also, he, he, set, he, he sort of set up in the coffee shops and bars there and, and establishing a pattern that he kept for the rest of his life, which is to live in a hotel room and then work and entertain in public or semi-public places of, of coffee shops and bars. And so he begins working, and he's always seen himself as a writer, by the way. This is, this is his goal. He says, I'm going to be a great writer. I'm going to just write novels, and they're going to be wonderful, and people are going to love me. He wasn't thinking so much of being a philosopher. And so he writes his first novel called Nausea, um, and it, it's rejected repeatedly. And this totally crushes him. Because up to this point in his life, he was the favored child of a middle class, a relatively well-off family. With the notion that he failed the one exam, he had always been top of his class. He's the bright one. People love him. Everything he's done, he's done on his own terms, and he's been successful. Ah, he writes this novel, Nausea, um, which does not go over very well. Even with his friends lobbying for him, he can't quite make this, this novel get out. And so this really gets him thinking. And what it gets him thinking about is being and nothingness, <laughs> it turns out. Uh, and he starts working first on another novel, but it ends up being increasingly on philosophical notes and sketches and ideas and outlines. Uh, uh, trying to generate or come up with a way to respond to the world now that he's sort of been, been crushed. There's a few seats right up here. So, finally, just before the war, nausea comes out, and, it's, and it sort of is a critical success and something of, of controversial. Uh, p- people either like it or they're opposed to it, but it's an event. And so all of a sudden, they're like, ah, Finally, I'm there, right? Newspapers are writing about him. He's getting invited to all the important literary functions, which in Paris is a very important thing. And then the war breaks out. And he gets drafted into the military, which is another hilarious idea to start in the military. It's like Wittgenstein in the military. And so he joins the military, or didn't join the military. He's drafted. He is in the military. For what people know what the phony war was, the phony, it was about seven months the beginning of the German-French conflict in which nobody did any fighting. And so it was weird, because they're all in the military, and there's Germany over there, and they're very bad, but the French aren't going to attack, and the Germans are busy crushing Czechoslovakia and Poland, and so they aren't going to attack the French until they get good and ready, and so they just hang out. And start... On one hand, he's not comfortable with the other soldiers. He has trouble getting along with them, but they don't have anything to do. And so he fills notebook after notebook after notebook after notebook with writing. It's probably one, if either the or one of the most productive periods of his life. And at some point he goes, wow, this is great. This is really great. Well, and then the war starts in earnest. Uh, almost immediately, because of course the French sort of ran away. Um, and, and, and so he's almost immediately captured and put in a German, uh, Germany, German prisoner of war camp in France. Uh, and he loves it. He, has, he, he really thinks this is one of the best things that ever happened to him intellectually, but he sort of really enjoyed it in a, in a visceral way, which is surprising, because this is a prisoner of war camp with the German guards with guns, and they would beat you and shoot you if you tried to escape. But it's not like a concentration camp uh, that, that would come along later. It's more like a Red Cross camp, Red Cross camp, a prisoner of war camp. Um, and it's run by the, the local Jesuit priests are put in charge to make sure things are sort of up, on the up and up. And so every morning he gets up and argues with the Jesuit priest for hours. Right? This is sort of apparently his job in the camp is to go argue with the Jesuit priest who ran the place. And the Jesuit monks would smuggle in books for him. So he's getting all these books, he's having these long philosophical arguments with the Jesuit priests, um, in particular the head one. And, and he stages a play, which is sort of a, uh, it's a, you know, a subtle 
strike against, uh, you know, to say, you know, we should stand up to our captors, but the reason we don't stand up to our captors is because we did, we'd be shot, right? So it plays out all these things in, in a quasi-Greek format. But it's really, so he's really thinking here. He's really trying to come to grips with what does it mean to be a human being when you're stripped of so much. This is what his break, one of his breakthroughs is. You're in a prisoner of war camp. You have no belongings. You have no choice about where you're going to go, when you're going to go there. Very limited choice about what you're going to do, although he's able to fudge a little about that and because and, he's a smart person and the guards weren't that aggressive at this point in the war. Um, and he's just... He just really focuses him. Plus, he's spending time with people he otherwise would not see. In the, in the high schools and the college, broad mix. In a prisoner of war camp, basically the whole society is there. The officers are there to the, the, the guys who are drafted off of the war for there. So he's talking to people, seeing them, getting to know them, hearing them. And so he's, you know, this, this, it becomes amazing to him. After a couple of months of this, he forges some documents and gets released. I mean, it's a weird thing about Vichy France at this point, right? So half of France kind of surrenders, and the other half of France is occupied, and they put up a puppet government. And so it's a very tenuous situation, but peaceful. Well, quasi-peaceful. And so he sort of immediately returns to Paris and is appointed as a professor, which is odd, right? So the Germans, he gets out of a prisoner of war camp and becomes a professor in Paris underneath the authority of the German government. Weird. So it's it's this sort of odd, tenuous situation. And he immediately starts thinking, okay, what do we do about resistance? How do you resist the German occupation? And one of the instructors at the school where he's teaching walks into class. Patan was the puppet leader of France at this point, the the, the Quisling, the guy who's serving um, for the German dictator, right? And he walks in with a poster of Bataan and he rips it up and throws it on the floor and stomps on it. And the students all cheer, yay! And then they just come and arrest him and throw him in jail. <laughs> and Sartre goes, that is a gesture, as he says. It's just a gesture. That's not an act. Because it doesn't accomplish anything. Ripping up a poster of Bataan and throwing it in the air and stomping on it, sure, you feel better and your students cheer you, but what have you accomplished? And so again, there's this other tension where he's like, look, I, I, I want to do something meaningful. I don't want to just react or respond. I, I want to try and think about this. And so because he's an intellectual, he tries to set up this secret network of intellectual anti-Nazi writers who are going to, it's not clear how, overthrow the government. And they have these schemes like they're going to make bombs, but they don't know anything about making bombs. They have this scheme where they're going to maybe attack a police station, but they pretty much don't want to kill anybody. Um, they, they, he, he goes all over trying to recruit people into this cause. And it's really not working out for him. But interestingly, he is more aggressively anti the Bataan and the Nazi government than most other people. But he just doesn't want to do anything stupid. He's trying to do something meaningful. And so he struggles with this almost the entire war. Um, and and he's, you know, it never, he never comes up with a good solution. He can never quite figure out how is it that you come about, how do you, how do you address the situation? Anyway, the war finally ends. Um, and right before the end of the war, I should mention, he actually publishes his big book, Being and Nothingness. And immediately at the end of the war, this becomes a cause celeb. Everybody is talking about it. Almost no one reads it, by the way, as, as <laughs> often with these books. And if you've ever tried to read it, you'll understand why. Um, but but it, it is the thinking. And here's the idea. This is where existentialism comes from, and this is key. But this is the gestation. I went a long time about that because the gestation of the work is crucial. It wasn't him sitting in, a, in an academic library going, you know, let's think about existence. You know, he's been in a prisoner of war camp. He's been in a high school in Mahal listening to the prostitutes and the dock workers on the streets. Um, he's been in, in, in Paris trying to figure out how you organize a resistance against a repressive government. So he's trying to think all this stuff through. It all informs what he's working on. And he comes up with this idea, which is really a radical break. And he says, look, and this is his example, by the way. If you see a pair of scissors, it's pretty clear 
that the idea of the scissors predates its existence. So essence, what the scissors mean, what they're f- for, comes before you get the scissors. Right? Like, like or, we have this little recording device thing here. Right? We don't look at that and think, oh, one of these days we'll figure out what it's for. No, what it's for was drawn up and thought about and sketched out, and then it came into being. For humans, he argued, it's just the other way around. We come into existence, we have no plan. We have no idea. We have no history. We did not create any of this. And here we are. And he says, what's happened preceding there earlier, right, is, is we've killed God. All the philosophers are, of course, busy killing God. Um, and he says, but what they want to do is replace them with some other plan. It can be reason. It can be the ethical imperative of, of, of Kant. It can be the dialectical actions of history that you get from Hegel. But for Sartre, he said, no, no, look, there is nothing. You kill God, what's left? Nothing. You get nothing. And so the human being, our existence, precedes any plan for us at all. There is no point to us. People say, well, what's the meaning of life? Sartre would say, there isn't one. You are the meaning of your life. There's nothing else. Hence, part that's the reason there's the nothingness. You exist and nothing. (laughs) There's no more. And so this puts you in this interesting position. On one hand, you are free because there is no out external. There's no God. There's no uh, superstructure of reason. There's no huge historical imperative or ethical. No, it's you. You're free. Congratulations. But he said this is sort of also a terrifying freedom. Um, Because, well, you're responsible. Utterly and completely responsible for your own life. If you feel like you may not want to get married, well, then you better work out some contract with the woman you love to avoid that. A very high bar. Something bad happens to you, that's your own fault. He actually said, we get the war we deserve. That's how far he went with it. He said, if if war comes to you, it's your fault. You get the war you deserve. No excuses. Completely free. But also completely responsible. And then he goes on and says, well, further, because we're free and responsible... And we're not omniscient, unfortunately. We don't know what all our acts are going to happen. We don't know what they're going to lead to. We don't know what they mean ahead of time. Therefore, we have to exercise total freedom outside of any constraint with complete responsibility when we don't know what's going to happen. It, it, again, terrifying. right? We don't know what's going to happen. I thought, oh, I'll go to this lecture tonight. You go to the lecture, the building burns down, we all die. We see it was our choice. And so Sard says, so you're responsible. In a way, you burnt the building down on top of yourself. <laughs> Seriously, you get the war you deserve. It's an interesting ethical implications. And we'll talk about that next book then. Um, so it, it creates an interesting position for people to be in. On one, it tries to say, look, you have to think now. You have to decide. You, as an individual, get to shape much that's going on with you in particular. And so all the things we take for granted, all of the aspects of of society and culture that we, we don't want to think about or reflect upon, that's fine, but you're still responsible for it. You, you still are acting that way or thinking that way. And you don't have to. Therefore, you're never a victim. You can never claim, for sorry, he says, you're never a victim. You cannot have that. Um, and, and there is essentially no random element. It says, we create everything. We bring everything onto ourselves. Also, he said, we are a totality in ourselves. 
And so everything we do, and this is where I sort of lapsed into psychoanalysis, this is where psychoanalysis and existentialism are very close. Every act, every gesture, every phrase, every saying is an expression of our totality. And because our being precedes our essence, it's not an expression of, this is where he sort of struggles with Freud, he says, look, we're not expressing something that happened to us in our childhood or some problem that comes to us from our social class, although we recognize that. He said, mostly we're expressing ourselves. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your social status or your upbringing. What you reveal in every one of your acts, every one of your details, is you. Some aspect, some nature of you. You are a totalizing individual and you can't escape that so people didn't know what to make of this actually honestly <laughs> one it, again almost immediately in one year Sartre goes from being almost unknown except for the people who are most invested in French literature to winning major literary prizes invited everywhere his lectures are sold out um, Gallimard basically signs every book he ever wants to write they say yes we'll give you money for every book you ever want and so he sets up a new life. And again, back to you're responsible for living how you want. And he called it the family. And it was himself and de Beauvoir and all of their friends. And they just worked, basically. He lived in this hotel or that hotel, worked in this cafe or, or that restaurant. He supported a lot of people, students who would help him with research. He would help support them. Um, he, he never owned anything. This is one of his he resistances to the whole bourgeois tradition. He says he didn't want anything. So he owned a pipe, his glasses, some writing paper, and really a couple of books in his whole life. He had not much more than that. Never bought real estate. He could have he could have set up the chateau out in the country and been the sort of elegant writer in, in, in residence out there, and he never does that. He lives very relative to his means, extraordinarily modestly, but then supports all these other people who help him work and are doing their work. His plays also start to be huge hits. But if you read them, they're didactic plays. I, I never really care for them, but that's aside the point, but because they're so strongly didactic of his existentialist theory. It's people who are put in these situations where um, they're responsible and their, their actions create their suffering. And so those are just the hit of, of the Paris intellectual scene. So people are just, they couldn't be any more enthusiastic. So what do you do now if you're sorry? You've written being an existent, being a nothingness, the existentialist tome that everybody's talking about but no one understands. Um, the term existentialism shows up in the newspapers to the point where he becomes, he starts disavowing it, right? He's like, look, I, I just, come on, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Have you read the book? Of course they haven't read the book, right? Uh, and he's going, let's move on, let's move on. And so everybody says, all right, so you've come up with this notion that I'm responsible for everything and I make the world. Well, how do we have ethics from that? Where do we get ethics? And so he writes um, what's been published as notebooks on ethics because he never finished it. He never finished writing it. Crucially, in Simone de Beauvoir's next time, she wrote her book on ethics called uh, Towards a Philosophy of Ambiguity. Sartre never did allow it to be published in his life. He was pretty much finished, but he wouldn't allow it to be published. Um, because it's so tricky, right? How can you make someone responsible for everything? Well, at the time he tries to argue this, and, and this is where we get a notion. He, he says during the war, and he said this publicly, but it's, it's a crucial part of the ethics. The French were never so free as when the Germans occupied France. And so you have to say, well, what could that possibly mean? They're sh literally shooting people in the streets, taking you out at night. It was, it was not pleasant. What did he mean? He said, well... Here's what the Germans are doing for us in that situation. When they focus your attention on what's crucial, he says, we think of freedom as freedom to do what we want. And existentialism says, yeah, we have a lot of freedom. But he says, if you look at what we do most of the time, it's trivia. We don't know why we're making the decisions we're making because we don't want to think about them. In, in the kinds of books that they wrote, he and, and Beauvoir and the other set, you know, the, the novels tend to be like 
okay, we're going to go try and kill a, a German guard. If we do that, they'll probably shoot 20 villagers randomly. If we don't do that, we're not resisting. Should we or should we not do this? To start, this is a crucial type of freedom. Not the freedom to do whatever you want, but the freedom that comes from actually trying to understand yourself, your motivation, your times, and what you're doing. I was thinking about it in terms of where we are currently, right? So our government keeps saying, look, go out and shop to save the economy. <clears throat> Don't think about it, shop. Don't worry about it, shop. So we have the freedom to do that. But Sartre would say that's not really freedom. Freedom would only come, in this instance, from saying, okay, what's wrong with the economy? What is my obligation within the economy? How responsible am I for it? We get the economy we deserve. How am I responsible for responding to it? What does it mean to me if I go out and shop or if I don't go out and shop? If everybody saves all their money, the economy is actually going to collapse totally, which would sort of be a cool historical experiment. <laughs> and then we would be responsible for that, both individually and collectively. If everybody goes out and spends all the money and borrows a bunch of money and spends that too, well, that's how we got where we are. <laughs> and we're responsible for that, both individually and collectively. And so uh, trying to negotiate that space, he said, requires one aspect of the ethics, careful reflection. You actually have to stop and think, what kind of world do I want? And so he has this idea, this is both in Being and Nothingness and in, in the Notebook Story of Ethics. He says, look, one of the great powers of, the, of, of humanity, and he's one of the first philosophers to talk about this, by the way, crucial point, is our imagination. Because the present comes to us from the future. This is the idea. Our present is always being brought to us by the future. This seems weird. It's not as complicated as it sounds, or as, or, or as absurd, although it sort of sounds absurd. Because uh, here's what we do. Right now we go, oh... I'm hungry. I think if I had eaten that pizza, or maybe after this lecture I'll get a pizza, then I wouldn't be hungry. And so my understanding of my current state is informed by how I feel now, but a lot more probably, or at least as much by how I imagine I could feel and how I imagine I will feel. So if I'm hungry now and I go, well, but it's only too long before I get food, okay, I'll be happy. <laughs> even though I'm hungry. If you go, I'm hungry now and I'm not going to get food for a long time, now you're unhappy, even though you're the exact same amount hungry. So what's happening is we're, we, we, we imagine the world. Right? We have our feelings, then we imagine the world, then we compare our feelings to our imagination, and then we go, let's run those forward. Here's how I'm going to feel, here's how I'm going to feel, here's how I'm going to feel, here's how the world's going to be, here's how the world's going to be, here's how the world's going to be. Now, if those come together at some point and they line up and I feel good, then I go, oh, that'll be great, and at some point I don't have to worry about it. So I'm happy now, not because of how I feel now, but because of how I feel in my imaginary relations between the future and the present, which is weird in a way. <laughs> But this isn't this right? Everybody, people have this feeling, right? That, that it, it, it really matters. If, if you are very hungry and you know you're going to get food in a little while, you don't care. If you're really hungry and you don't think you're going to get food in a little while, then you, you sort of get upset. Notice that's not having that much to do with how you feel now. And he said, so one part of this is that our imaginations are constructing the world. Now but also in the future. And so obviously as a writer and as a, someone who associates with artists who work in the realm of the imagination quite a bit, he said, so this is a huge part of your ethics, your imagination, your projection of how the world could be becomes this crucial element in understanding both your present, possible future, and then making that possible future, making that actually true in, in sort of the physical, real-world sense. And so he sort of pursues this idea in his, in his morals of saying that a lot of what we're responsible for is how we imagine and relate to the world. 
Therefore, we're also very much responsible, and in this case he's talking specifically as a writer, but in, in general, that of understanding that the world is a process of giving. That what we want to do is give to people. We want to give of our imaginations, and if they give of their imaginations, then between us, we can sort of construct a world that might line up better for everybody. It's a weird ethical concept. I can see why I never published it, because I think it would have been hugely controversial at the, at the time, and we'll see why that is for his next major work. But it's important to remember that he was writing this very aesthetic, but also very psychological, but deeply personal notion of ethics. That it, it, A lot of it has to do about how we imagine the world. If, if I imagine um, that I need some, you know, I, I don't, teak hardwood floor for 10,000 square feet, and I can't be happy without that, somewhere we're cutting down some old, old growth rainforest, right? And so that's going to make that kind of world. Um, if I imagine a different kind of world, we might be able to make that kind of world. And so we're, we're not only responsible for how we project ourselves in the world and our acts, which is usually what people want to talk about with ethics, specifically Nietzsche. Nietzsche, remember, going back, said, you can only judge a person by their acts. What they're thinking, why they're doing things, that's none of our business. You don't, you don't access that. Sartre says, no, what we're imagining is a huge component of constructing the world. Imaginations really matter in an ethical sense. There's no right or wrong there, by the way. He wasn't, he wasn't talking about good and evil, right and wrong. He's just saying this is, this is what makes for ethics, is this notion of, of sort of communal imagination. Very strange notion. At the same time, however, politically in France, things have, have become touchy, let's say. So during the war, there was the resistance. And the resistance was really made up of sort of the communists, who were well organized, and then lots of other fringe groups, some of which were actually pretty damn conservative. And then you had de Gaulle, who is a Catholic, conservative, it would be a generous, perhaps reactionary, Catholic, old-style, general politician. And so they clean out the Pataan government. There is, of course, no government really left. De Gaulle has the, the army and sort of the support of a lot of people. And then you have all the resistance fighters. Many of them are, are communists. Many more of them are very, very left, socialists, anarchists. Well, how do you form a government? You have the, you know, de Gaulle, the, the icon of Catholic old world French upper middle class, you know, military guy. And, you know, sort of the, one of their spokespeople, sort of Andre Malraux, you know, would be communist, revolutionary, uh, guy who, who sort of does not agree with de Gaulle on basically anything. And so they form a coalition government. <laughs> and it's not going smoothly, as you might well imagine. They're trying to negotiate everything. And so the question is this, right? And, 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 and of course, Stalin and, and the Soviets have captured half of Europe. Right? This is the, I mean, it's, we always think that we won World War II. Maybe, but Eastern Europe certainly lost. Right, having been crushed by the Nazis, they were then crushed by Stalin and the Soviets. So if, whoever won is not clear, but we know Eastern Europe definitely lost. And the question is, what do you do now? Whose side do you take? And the problem is, and again, we, we struggle with this, as you go, okay, on one hand, oh, and, and France is very poor now, by the way. They actually suffered more after the war economically than they did during the war. So you're looking at the future and you go, all right, are we going to go socialist Marxist, which is to say lean towards Russia and the Communist Party of France, or are we going to go sort of Western and America? Are we going to go for modern industrial capitalism and, and pop, pop culture? This is really the, how they saw the distinction. Liberal democracy, as it were. And, and people couldn't decide because the spokesperson for sort of liberal democracy was a Catholic general, General de Gaulle. And they're like, look, we just don't want this sort of quasi-liberal democracy under a general who's also Catholic and basically from the last century. Um, and so everyone's trying to work this out. Most of the intellectual class and most of the writers went hard for the communists originally. 
And then slowly, as Stalin became increasingly more obviously a, a, a murderous nut job, um, they, they, they sort of backed away from that. But at the time, it was a real question. People didn't know which would be better, because it was an ethical question. They weren't asking themselves, which would make me richer? They're saying, what's going to make a better France? Uh, I think retroactively, it's easy to see this. So in this political environment, Sartre decides to write a book called The Critique of Dialectical Materialism. Yay, not another one of his bestsellers. Very thick, nobody reads it. But controversial, because he says, we've got to go with the communists, with a few caveats. Right? And, and everybody hated Sartre. Not hated, they loved him, he was an intellectual icon, but they, but they disagreed with him politically. The, the left, the communists, because he said, look, Stalin is a murderous nut job with all these death camps. He oughtn't do that. And they said, you can't criticize Stalin. That's the Communist Party. On the right, they said, look, he's endorsing the communists. So he's always negotiating in these marginal spaces. But the problem that he had is, it, well, people know what dialectical materialism is? A <laughs> little, little key. So you get two parts here. You get the dial. Have you heard this phrase? Yeah, isn't that great? We hear these phrases, we have no idea what they mean. Yeah. So, uh, so the dialectical is from Hegel. Um, it's a Hegelian concept, and it's the notion, it's a very nice notion, that works out that, that history for Hegel works like this. You get a thesis, which is just an idea. Very straightforward, not too complicated. An idea like, say, oh, the aristocracy. Right? An idea here in the sense of the other historical idea. Then you get an antithesis. So this thesis is going to be counteracted by a force that says, well, here's the aristocracy, so we're going to get a resistance to the aristocracy. Historically, this turns out to be the divine right of kings. The, the kings, by the way, are opposed to the aristocracy, and they hate the aristocracy because they limit the power, the authority of the king. right? And so then you get, you get the thesis and you get the antithesis, and then at some point, the tension between these two things produces the next stage, which will be... Uh, a synthesis, which will be something new, some new form. Now, this synthesis is, in fact, a new thesis. And so this new thesis will then evoke another antithesis, which will then produce another synthesis. And you get this little engine that produces all of history, according to Hegel. It's a series of syntheses. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, thesis, and they just work off of each other. Ah, but it's a teleological system. I mean, it's going someplace. This little engine is taking us somewhere. And the place it's taking us is to the end of history. And it, it, people know there's a book called The End of History written by Francis Fukuyama. It's one of the dumbest books ever written. But, but it was this Hegelian thesis that we have arrived at the end of history. Um, and that what it is, is the perfecting of human government. Let's abbreviate that. And so this keeps going on, and that every synthesis, is, it, which is a new thesis, is basically an improvement on the previous one. It's a directional. We get a little better and a little better and a little better. The, the Greeks were better than the... Than the uh, chaos before than the Egyptians, the Romans were better than the Greeks, the Byzantines were better than the Romans, the uh, Middle Ages were better than the Byzantine, until you get modern Republican democracy and the perfecting of the human social structure. End of history. Not because things stop happening, but because the thesis and antithesis synthesis breaks down because there's no antithesis, because we've perfected what we're doing. So this is the Hegelian idea. He also said that it's going from east to west because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. What did I thought? Well, he's just making shit up now. But, but that's what he said. That was his argument. This is part of his argument. I'm like, that's not convincing at all. <laughs> this is more convincing. At least it's elaborate, right? Um, so Marx, who was a student of Hegel, comes along and says, well, I like your structure, dialectical, but it needs to be material. 
It is not some abstract social stuff. It's the material relations of the means of production. Hence Marxism. Also, he's coming up later after de Beauvoir. Um, so this idea is that you add to this notion the material goods. Any society has so much material goods. You have land resources, you have uh, labor resources, you have wood, you have coal, oil, for instance, in our society. How you organize that is what determines the conditions of existence. And so you have a thesis, I know the state will own everything. Then you have an antithesis, people say we don't like that, and they overthrow the state. And so boom, off, you're off and running. But it's based on the material means the distribution is of the goods of production or the material stuff themselves. So it's not an abstract concept. It's a material, concrete synthesis, thesis, antithesis system. Also teleological. It's off to some place. Here we go. And that is to the perfect society, which is where the, the means of production, the goods and services in any economy, are all owned basically by, a, by the state. They're basically owned by everybody communally, but ends up being, of course, by the state. And then this will break down because that is the perfect form of government. So again, unlike Hegel in some ways, but in other ways very much like Hegel. Uh, somebody said he just took Hegel, Hegel and just flipped him upside down. I mean, that's Marx. Um, now, notice this, though. If you're born into a system of dialectical history, whether it's materialism or Hegelian, it doesn't really matter, well, all kinds of things are determined for you. Your essence does precede your existence because your essence is as a member of some part of this, anthro- of this uh, dialectical system. You're in some form of government and that determines all the key aspects of you. If, if you're a proletariat worker, Marx had that all worked out. What you thought, how you're going to live, how you're going to be. If you were the uh, oppressive bourgeois property-owning classes, well, he had that worked out too. That's what determined who you were, your class. That was your essence. We've heard this, class warfare. Uh, Low class people are like this, middle class people are like this, upper class people are like that because of their class. Same thing with race. We say, oh, if you're this race, you must be like that. Your essence precedes you because your race precedes who you are. Your class precedes who you are. See, Sartre can't have that. So the little tricky problem he had was how do you embrace dialectical materialism because he wanted to side with the communists without accepting their notion of history, which is to say Marxism. So because so, that would overthrow existentialism because it would say your essence, your, your class or whatever would precede your being, which is exactly the opposite of what he was trying to argue. So he writes a very long book, many, many aspects of this argument, but one of the key ones is he says, look, there is no teleology. You have the engine, you have the dialectical, it's not going anywhere. There, it, it doesn't produce anything. It's not directional. Um, it recreates itself basically at every single moment. And therefore it does not determine who you are. You can, in fact, exist in a dialectical material model without being predetermined because you're still free, totally free to choose. Now, this does not go over well with anybody, it turns out. Because it's like if you get rid of dialectical materialism, the communists don't like you. The communist thinkers, not the like Soviet communists, they just shoot everybody. But the, the, the people who are sort of trying to intellectually align themselves. Um, he pissed off, and this is very late in the day, but game, by the way. And now he's pissing off a lot of the liberal thinkers who are like, look, Stalin is just crazy. Communism is collapsing. It's repressing the Hungarians. The Czechs are in trouble. Why are you writing about this? Just let go. Move on. The future is progressive democracy. Sartre never saw the future as progressive democracy. And this attempt to hedge is complicated and subtle, and what it actually ends up doing is destroying dialectical materialism without ever really offering any defense of of existentialism. So it's a great book to read if you want to attack Marxist theory. It's not a very good book to read if you want to know anything about anything else. (laughs) Because he keeps trying to save, he keeps saying, oh, I love it, but, oh, this is a great idea, except it's completely wrong. You know, so you can read it chapter by chapter that way. Um, At this point now, another problem intervenes anyway. So we've got the whole politics of, of communism, 
post-communism, the West and, and the growing East. Oh, and colonialism. Right? So the French colonies are also devolving. So where do you come down on that? Right? Should the French nation keep all of its colonies? Um, Sartre decides almost immediately, absolutely not. Get rid of the colonies. Set all of the colonies free. Um, and this was a, a pretty popular mainstream opinion. And he's involved very active in many court cases. Um, he was tried for sedition, or almost tried for sedition, um, for trying to overthrow the government and various things as he works against this. Curiously, he ends up working with de Gaulle on this, because it's de Gaulle who actually liberates, uh, who, who works out to free the Algerians. This is the element that, that really the main, although people know that Algeria is still a problem, right? Well, it was, a, it was a problem then, and it's de Gaulle that sort of gets France out of the problem of Algeria. But interestingly, there's a lot of French thinkers, not the least of which Malraux and Camus, who said, no, this is wrong. You've got it wrong. Yes, colonial system has been bad. Yes, we've exploited them. But going into the future, what's the best we can do? And they start quoting existentialism back at them. We're not bound by the past. We can create it new. We can imagine a better relationship between France and her colonies. Should we help them or abandon them? If you look in Africa, the, the health of the French colonies is more or less trackable to how long France stayed there. The longer France stayed, the better they were doing. And, and the earlier the French withdrew, the earlier those societies tended to collapse. And so there's some evidence, very strong evidence, is just that Camus and Malraux might have been a little bit more on the right side of this, although it's, it's a tricky system. But so Sartre is in there trying to think through this. He also comes to America at this time. And, he, and he, it's the first time he's ever been to America, doesn't speak the language, tours all over the place. And one of the, he goes back to France, and the first thing he writes about, almost, if not the first thing, is he says, look, the, the, this repression of black people, that is just insane. How can America do this? And he was on a tour with 20 other leading journalists, thinkers, and writers. And when they all went back, 19 of them wrote nothing about African Americans. Sartre is the one who immediately sat down and said, this is a problem, America's got to fix it. And then, of course, he gets attacked by everybody again. right? Because if you're anti-communist, you're pro-America. And so they say, oh, you're just a communist dupe again, so you're finding some way to attack America. Right, um, But he wasn't say overthrow America. He wasn't say, oh, this proves that America is bad and evil and horrible. He says it's just a problem they've got to work through like our colonial problem. Well, now the communists are pissed off. <laughs> right? And so he's always doing this. Right? He's never making very many people happy at any time. Um, and, and so again, he, he's, his works remain remarkably complicated because he doesn't want to just take simple ideological responses or answers. All this time, by the way, he's also becoming increasingly famous. At this point, by the time he comes out with a dialectical critique of dialectical reason, he's practically a state icon. Um, at one point, they want to put him on trial, and de Gaulle says, no, you can't put, you can't put him on trial. He says, um, you know, he, he's, he's untouchable. And he writes a letter to the judge, and he says, France does not put Voltaire on trial. It just, you just don't, it can't be done. And so he becomes sort of, he, he's attained the status of untouchable. And so that really freed him up to do whatever he wants, sort of in the ideal existentialist way. When you have de Gaulle unwilling to, to raise a finger to, to, to get at you. Um, and so towards the end of his life, and again, this whole time he's writing movie scripts, he's doing lots of other things. Uh, but crucially, two last things to, to end on. One, he writes a three-volume biography of, of Gustave Flaubert, the French um, novelist. And he, he kept writing uh, biographies his whole life. He's got a famous one on Genet. Uh, but if you read these, and again, it's three volumes long, and it's tough going, it's not clear that he was interested in Flaubert or Genet or any of his other subjects at all. <laughs> What he wanted to do is use them to demonstrate his theories of the individual, of the psychology of the individual, how they work in society, and how their internal struggles were made manifest in their writing, in their encounters with history, 
So again, back to the existentialist notion. Everything you do gives yourself away. So how can we use everything that someone did, generally writers, to talk about how they're giving their sufferings, their ideas, not what they wrote, which was sort of, he was marginally interested in that, but mostly how they related to their writing and their actions. So they're sort of like very long, drawn-out psychological analyses of the individual writers, which are also long, drawn-out psychological analyses of Sartre, of course, because what they reveal are his obsessions, the things he was most interested in, the passages that he would light on, the relationships that he thought were studied. Um, and, and so the, and he, it's called the idiot of the family, uh, Gustave Flaubert. Uh, and and, and the, the notion that the central thing that he wanted to point out here is Flaubert hates the bourgeoisie. If, if anybody read Madame Bovary, by the way, it, it, fabulous, short, entertaining novel. It's the, as far as I know, the best critique of the middle class ever written. I mean, it's just brutal. Gustave Flaubert hated the middle class, absolutely hated them. And was, of course, as Sartre demonstrates conclusively, the iconic middle class guy. <laughs> right? I mean, this is who he was. And so this great tension that he felt between the values that were there, that, that he embodied, and, and the fact that he hated much of them, very much like Sartre again. So here's Sartre, who on one hand, again, now at this point, he really is a cultural icon. People modeled themselves after him. Um, but again, he doesn't own anything. He, he, he lives in a hotel still. He can sort of continue to move around hotels and right till the very end of his life. Um, spends lots of time in cafes and coffee shops. Sort of a semi-public figure in that sense. Um, but his mom at this point had moved to Paris. Her second husband has died. And so almost every morning and many afternoons he goes over to play four-handed piano with his mom. She cooks him breakfast. She does his laundry. Um, and, and they were just basically they were great pals for the rest of their lives. Um, and so it's, again, this interesting dynamic that he sets up. And, and he says, very unapologetically, he says, well, you know, it's my life. And, and what I do, what we do every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, how we imagine is up to us. We have this opportunity. We have this freedom. It's a terrible freedom because we're responsible for it. But if I want to have seven mistresses and write my my lifelong partner Simone de Beauvoir about all of them while I have my mother doing my laundry and I live in rundown hotel rooms even though I'm the most famous writer alive in France hey I can do that and so can you right if you want but if you don't and if you don't want well, well don't yell at me and don't yell at anybody else because we have the freedom and we have the responsibility because there's nothing that precedes us that tells us this is how you must be. This is what must happen. It's entirely, which may be an exaggeration, but for Sartre he says it is entirely up to us and down to us to imagine and live the lives that we think we can and we want to. And most of the time we sort of chicken out. <laughs> but some of the time, and some of our best times, like when you're in a prisoner of war camp or when the Germans are occupying your country, you're forced to think, decide, and act on your best impulses. And hence, that's when you become most free and have the opportunity to express yourself most completely. And so, Jean-Paul Sartre, I would say.